I accompanied Lou to your 50th birthday party at Madison Square. It was an absolutely fantastic evening. And I, I know you sang uh, Queen Bitch, I'm Waiting for the Man, Dirty Boulevard, and yeah. White Light, White Heat. Yeah. Uh, t tell me about those songs. Why those songs? Um, I think, well, firstly, Waiting for the Man, I think, is probably the most important of the four, in a way. Um, a then manager brought back an album. It was, uh, it was just a plastic demo album of uh, Velvet's very first album in 1965-ish, something like that. And uh, he was particularly pleased because Warhol had signed the sticker on the middle. I still have it, by the way. I still have that. Uh, album, and he said, uh, well, the, the, I don't know why he's doing music, this music's as bad as his painting. I thought, mm, I'm going to like this. So I've, <laughs> I'd never heard anything quite like it. It was a revelation to me. Um, and then, so, and so it influenced your own writing and music in some way? I think, um, it, yes, tentatively, it, it influenced what I was to do for the next few years. Uh, I don't think it outrightly, I don't think I ever felt that I, I, I was in a position to become a, a Velvet's clone. But there were elements of what Lou was doing that I thought were just uh, unavoidably right for both the times and for where music was going. One of it was the use of, the, of, of cacophony as uh, background noise and uh, to create a kind of an ambience that had been hitherto unknown in rock, I think. Um, and the other thing was the, the nature of his lyric writing, which for me, uh, just it smacked of things like Hubert Selby Jr. Um, uh, that had recently been the uh, last exit from Brooklyn, which, uh, and also John Wretch's book, uh, Cities of the Night, both books of which made a, a, a huge impact on me. And uh, Lou's writing was right in that ballpark. It was, Dylan had certainly brought a new kind of uh, intelligence to pop songwriting, but then Lou had taken it even further into the avant-garde and in, uh, and had it had its roots in uh, Baudelaire and uh, Rombo and that side, that other thread of history, which isn't talked about very much. Which it is now, of course. Now it is history, but at that time it was merely a, um, a, a thread. It wasn't considered important. In fact, uh, I couldn't have asked for anything better than what you just said. It was wonderful. Uh, you introduced Lou that night as the king of New York. And, <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, and Chris Walken was in the audience. And I felt awful afterwards. He said, hey, I'm the king of New York. I said, of course you are. Well, this makes you... Uh, I have you... all the royalty here. I said... <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell me how Lou is the king of New York to you? Well, it's the New York that I want to know about. I think there are probably everybody has their own New York, but for me, New York was always James Dean walking out in the middle of the road. Um, and it was always the Fugs, the village Fugs. And it was always, it was the Beats and it was Soho. And it was uh, that kind of uh, uh, the bohemian intellectual extravagance that, that made it so vibrant for, for someone like me growing up in quite a, a grey, suburban, tenement-filled South London environment. It seemed to be, that seemed to be the heart, the network of life, you know, and it's where we all wanted to escape to. If, if people were like me, we wanted to out and we wanted in to places like New York, far more so than the West Coast. Mm, right. Uh, I noticed that that night when the two of you were playing, there was so much sort of fun on stage, and so Lou, I could see Lou's face was just so happy, and. Just talk a little bit of what it's like to play those songs with Lou. Um, <laughs> it's, it's strange working with Lou. That's the first time we've actually worked like that together since the time that we uh, made Transformer album. And uh, all I could see was luggage. <laughs> but the interesting thing was, because we'd sort of, uh, uh, at one period, not see much of each other is that these were suitcases I didn't know about. <laughs> I wanted to see what was in them. Um, I, I, over the last year or two, we've reacquainted uh, with each other, and, and uh, it's so nice at this time in our lives, I think, to kind of look back and see that we've both had considerable artistic successes um, since we both began. 
and it's nice to feel that you've uh, contributed in a fairly major way to how music, how your chosen art has progressed, because it's the way that one wanted it to do when you started off, you think. Uh, I know what I want it to do, you know. And I think both of us f feel that we, we did what we set out to do, which was change the uh, course of the river a bit. You know, there's sort of this relationship between the two of you that's a very rare sort of transatlantic connection that is unusual yeah. in music, I think, and that's what's extraordinary to me. Yes, I think... Uh, the influences back and forth between... I think there's a mutual regard for the differences between ourselves. Um, we both, as you obviously know, that we have very bit different backgrounds. Um, uh, also, I think that uh, we probably have different interests in life, but there are certain areas where we definitely meet. I think in, in visual terms and also in uh, literature, I think we both have very similar likes. Both Burroughs nuts. And uh, uh, he was taught by Schwartz, wasn't he? Delmar Schwartz. Was yeah, yeah, first yeah. Great, that's right. Uh, teacher who that's right. That's are you familiar right. with Schwartz? Yes, I am. Yeah. 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 Lou talks about that as being. He, he sees the, the great short stories of Schwartz's as sort of a way that inspired him to write his own songs into very condensed material. And I know you've sort of quoted once the John Lennon about how uh, he said, uh, let me find my quote here, uh, it was... Uh, Say what you mean. Thank you. Yeah, Lennon, I think, yeah, Lou did, did grasp that very quickly. Say what you mean, rhyme, make it rhyme, and put it to a backbeat. And, and uh, and Lou was always very concise like that. And that's sort of he never secret. wasted words. And that's maybe a secret to your own writing too, I think. I don't know. I think I, I get a lot more elaborate. I mean, I tend to be far more Baroque than, than Lou, but that's the British in me. Okay. And, <laughs> and Transformer, if you could just... I say what I mean, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to go the long way around, though. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Transformer, of course, was a tremendously important uh, transitional record for Lou. And can you talk a little bit about that album? I mean, the Walk on the Wild Side, the first time you heard it, did you, how did it change from that moment? Uh, the thing is with Lou, he was so uh, generous to work with. I mean, I was petrified that he said, yes, he would like to sort of work with me and in, in, uh, with me in the, in, in the producer capacity because uh, I had so many ideas and I felt so uh, intimidated by uh, my knowledge of the work that he'd already done. I mean, even though there was sort of only that much time between us, it seemed like Lou had this great legacy of work, which indeed he did have. Um, and that I've, it, it felt impertinent of me to kind of recommend that we do things in certain styles and certain ways, but he just gave the whole project over to me. and. Uh, I really hoped that I wouldn't let him down. You know, I really wanted it to work for him um, and be a memorable album that people wouldn't forget. And uh, like Herbie Flowers, the bass slide. Yes, he let me choose uh, an awful lot, well, the, all the musicians for it. And of course, Ronson was a major, major part of it all. And the sax was your teacher? <laughs> yeah, yeah, baritone sax player. At one time, was in the top three in uh, the world with Jerry Mulligan. Uh, his name's Ronnie Ross, sadly not with us anymore. Um, what year is Transformers? Oh, I don't know things like that. <laughs> it must have been maybe 73. I don't know. I you, you, was it two? 72, indeed. Yeah, yeah. There you are. Um, other songs in there, we'll go very quickly. Uh, Vicious, Andy's Well, Jeff, Vicious, I, I mean, Vicious. I, I love the fact that, they, that the record company at the time, I think was RCA, did agree that Walk on the Wild Side was a classic. A wonderful song. Absolutely brilliant. Um, but I, I'd, I really wanted them to bring out Vicious, thank you. Bring out Vicious as a second single. I'm not sure that they ever did, but I felt that would have been a great single. Mm. I think, looking back on them, of course, they're all such memorable, well-crafted and well-written pieces of work. It's almost like, ah, oh, there we are. I mean, there's so many songs on here that should and could have been, and probably will be one day, singles by favorites? other bands. Any other favorites on there? Um, sure, let's see. Let's give, uh, let's give Satellite of Love uh, to Blur, and we'll give Perfect Day to Suede, um, Vicious to Placebo. You see, I mean, it, it, there's so many songs here that could definitely make up to RuPaul, I suppose. <laughs> 
probably did. And New York Telephone Conversation. I did. That. Great one. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, glam rock, uh, essentially. I, I glam rock, right? I'm invented. sorry you've lost me there. <laughs> glam rock. Nope. <laughs> um, I have here that you invented it, and I sense. Well, of course. <laughs> It's this. It's still incredibly important today. That 25 years later, that the influence of glam rock is just staggering. Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, you know, I think John Lennon had that great line about glam rock is just rock and roll. With lipstick on. That's right. and you can say it again. I think uh, I'll say it again. Yeah. I'll say it again. Yes, John Lennon called it uh, called glam rock, um, rock and roll with lipstick on. Uh, I think he understated. Uh, I think he simplified. I think that they're probably why glam rock seems to have such episodic longevity about it is that it really wasn't too easy to define. It was made up of so many nuances. Um, it had the very straightforward, almost Puritan aspects of New York dolls. They're quite easy to suss out what their focus was. But then it had all this kind of arty, neo-pretentious thing from the Brit art school lot including for, foremostly myself, and, uh, and Roxy Music. We saw, naturally enough, we, we kind of piled it on with uh, 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 innuendo from the Dadaists and from the idea of the uh, androgyny thing that happened with Duchamp and the photographs that he took of himself and all that. And, and we and tried... to connection to Glam Rock, how would you describe that? <sighs> Again, I think initially, more than anything else, just the verbal and musical zeitgeist that he created. His, he gave us the environment in which to put our uh, uh, vision, our more theatrical vision. He, he supplied us with the, the street and the, uh, the landscape, and we peopled it. In the movie Basquiat, where you played Andy Warhol, and I think brilliantly, and I've talked to Lou about this, and he thinks it was it's just unbelievable performance. <laughs> what side of Andy do you think you captured that Lou responded to so positively? I think that he was actually a very nice guy. I never found him anything other than polite, uh, insecure, quite vulnerable, uh, bitchy, in the nicest possible way. Very funny. And a little bit in awe of his own reputation. I never felt that he had the kind of confidence that so many others would have you believe. I never saw him as the man of steel and this kind of hard-nosed manipulator. I think anybody who does well in their craft pretty much keeps on course and knows what they want and does, thing, and, and, and does things in a particular manner. And he probably did that as much as any of us did. But I don't ever, I didn't feel that he was quite as assured about what it was he was doing or why he was actually as big as he was. I don't, I'm sure that he ever really understood why. Sort of a last question, um, combination question, uh, to tell me anything you want to about Lou would be one of them. And also, Lou is popular <laughs> in Europe. And yeah. Can you... Does it, does it make any sense that Lou sort of is this sort of personification of New York or a, some American archetype? Is there something you could talk about Lou in that context? Um, I think he got, I think he, as in, a, in an iconic sense, I think he, projects the feeling of the bad boy that we all, especially when we were younger, so passionately want to be. I think he uh, was the first man that you believe there are so many doors that are closed on his life that you would quite like to unlock, but maybe you wouldn't really. Um, there's a kind of an, uh, there's a, um, a melodious kind of enig enigmatic thing about him, which is... Uh, in the hierarchy of rock gods, that pantheon of mythology that we've developed, I think he's a needed uh, deity. Absolutely. Uh, we're, uh, my questions are done, unless Karen wants to... Oh, I'm sorry. 
<clears throat> first time you met, if you could just tell me, I remember reading it was at the Ginger Man in New York in 1971. Was it? Does it bring back, uh, you can just make it up. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the, well, the, uh, one, the, the yeah. earliest... I, tell, I have a very funny story, actually. Oh, please. Oh, please. and this is... This yeah, is yeah. I told Lou he could not believe this. He thought this was yeah. hysterical. I first, I first saw The Velvet Underground in, I think it might have been about 71. And a friend of mine who worked on Rolling Stone magazine at the time said, you're lucky to have come into New York this week. The uh, Underground are probably playing one of their last gigs at the Electric Circus. And it was uh, probably the last days of the Electric Circus. So I went along and I got in the front row and I was the world's biggest fan. I was singing along with Lou, every word. And they were all there. And, uh, and uh, I thought, this is just heaven. I died and gone to heaven. I come straight from Britain, first day in, in the States. I'm here in New York watching Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. At, uh, after the show, I went backstage and I knocked on the door. And Lou came to the door. And uh, I said, look, I'm from England. I know all about your music. I said, you're virtually unknown in England, but I'm doing like a one-man PR job on this band because I think you're so great. Can we talk? So we sat down. We talked for about half an hour, and I talked about it, the songs and all the writing, whatever. And it was, it was, just, it was uh, just so special for me. About a week later, I saw this journalist friend of mine. I said, Lou was so great. And he talked with us. He said, no, Lou left the band about a year ago. I said, well, so who was that? He said, that was Doug Yule. <laughs> I said, Doug Yule? I said, but he didn't tell me that he wasn't Lou. And we were talking about songs like Waiting for the Man. <laughs> it was the most extraordinary thing. And then, then Lou told me a, a few weeks ago, he said, he said, yeah, you know, I did a book signing a few weeks ago, and Doug Yule was in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're done. Uh, All right. Okay. Lou Reed. Lou Reed. Lou Reed. Velvet Underground. Velvet Underground. Velvet Underground. Say what you mean. Say what you mean. Make it rhyme and yeah. put it. The, 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 the Lenin quote. <laughs> which is one of precisely. Um, Say what you mean. Make it rhyme. Make it rhyme. And, and put it to. What, what's the last put line? Put it to a backbeat. Yeah, okay. Say what you mean, make it rhyme, put it to a backbeat. Say what you mean, make it rhyme, put it to a backbeat. Okay. Two things and we're done. Uh, two minutes. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm David Bowie. No, without talking. Oh, 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 I see, I see. It's just a silent. Looking right into the, into the, yeah.